Well, a happy Friday morning. I am uh, extra peppy on a Friday. Do you know why, John Anthony? Can you think? You caught me off guard here. Come I on, my Dr. Pepper. Yet, Come brother. on. I know you haven't had your Dr. <laughs> Pepper. Uh, were you not watching any sports last night? Were you watching or following the Major League Baseball game that was going on I, last uh, night? I, I was. I checked when I woke up from my nap. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Congratulations. How exciting. Thank you very much, I'm sure there, you John. don't really care. Do you care about the Subway Series angle of it at no. all? No. No, I didn't think no. in New York that was even a deal. No, no. I want Mets Royals, man. That's what I want to see. I want 2015 all over again. I want that rematch. Huh? I want the rematch. I hate the New York Yankees. There is no team I hate in sports more than the New York Yankees. It's not even close. Now, is it the team or their fans, really? <laughs> well, no, it's both. It's both. <laughs> it's George Steinbrenner to every single fan I've ever dealt with growing up in uh, northern New Jersey. I absolutely hate the New York Yankees. But, yes, as a Mets fan, they won a thriller of a Game 3 last night in the Wild Card Series. They were uh, down 2-3. And then one of the all-time great radio calls you're going to hear last night, Howie Rose Mets Radio Network, Pete Alonzo hitting a go-ahead three-run blast top of the ninth inning to put him up. Williams sets. Here's the pitch. Swing on a fly ball to right field. Pretty well hit. Freelick back at the wall. He jumps. It's gone. He did it. He did it. Pete Alonzo with the most memorable home run of his career. Pumps his fist as he rounds second. It's a three-run homer. He's given the Mets a 3-2 to two lead. They all pour out of the dugout. Alonzo on his way to home plate. They're waiting for him. He hits the plate. He is first congratulated by Nimmo. Hugged by Lindor. There are a dozen Mets waiting for him outside the dugout. Pete Alonso keeps this fairy tale season going with the fairy tale swing of his career. Three to two, New York. Come on, that's a great radio call right there. Baseball season is way too long. Playoff baseball is amazing. That guy's great. He's amazing. Who is the guy? Howie Rose. Okay. Yes. He Did is he uh, one where he talks. He got excited like that. He says, he says, get your big butt out of here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did one of those calls one time. Oh, he's he's all time, man. And just <laughs> if you're a if you're just a casual sports fan, just understand that that home run last night that put the Mets up three two in game three of the wild card series, Pete Alonso is the first player in major league baseball history to hit a go ahead home run while trailing in the ninth inning or later of a winner-take-all postseason game. So that puts it into perspective, just how unusual that ending was last night. Royals going, of course, to uh, New York tomorrow, take on the Yankees. Let's hope they spank them around a little bit. Mets and Phillies tomorrow. We'll have previews with uh, Kevin Keatsman at 7.30 today. We will have a guy used to work with. He's uh, the pre- and post-game hope of the, uh, host of the Yankees. Justin Shackle at about 8.15. So we'll get both sides of that. Of course, the town is all about the sports right now. Royals, Chiefs are on Monday Night Football, of course, taking on the Saints. So exciting times all around. And on top of that, it's also pretty exciting that yesterday, the Dock Workers Union decided, you know what? We probably shouldn't strike or continue this strike with a month to go until the election. The... Guys who run the unions, who always typically lean Democrat, came to the conclusion that, you know, this might actually hurt Kamala Harris. So the union representing 45,000 striking dock workers up and down the East Coast from Maine down to Texas reached a deal yesterday. After three days, they have suspended their strike until January 15th to provide time to negotiate a new contract. The International Longshoremen's Association decided, you know what, we're going to go back to work. And trust me, they're doing okay. According to the Associated Press, a person briefed on the agreement said the ports sweetened the wage offer from 50% over six years to 62% wage increase over six years. Would you take that? That's not too shabby. 62% wage increase. Over six years. That's pretty good. Find me a place in America where you're not going to sign up for that right now. The union went on strike uh, midnight on Tuesday after their contract expired in a dispute over pay and the automation of tasks at 36 different ports. 
Now, of course, this could have been disastrous. You could have had, ahead of the election and ahead of the holidays, things backed up from just not just gifts for Christmas, but things like basic necessities, toilet paper, paper towels, soap. I mean, all those things that come through, unfortunately, from other parts of the world. Now, there's been the approach of this is a reason we should manufacture more in America. Absolutely. I completely agree. But that's not what this strike ultimately is about. The strike is about wages and the strike is about limiting automation. And when it comes to limiting automation, well, you got to be careful here. If you're the dock workers, if you push too much to the point where these companies are going to say, you know what, I can't justify paying you 40 bucks an hour. Plus overtime, plus benefits. I can't justify doing that. I am going to have to automate to keep myself in business because if not, by the way, I've got to pass this cost on to the consumer and they've already been hit with a 25% inflation hike over the last three and a half, four years. I just can't keep doing it. So you've got to be careful what you wish for. But here's what we do know. The dock workers are saying, hey, we're just trying to get some raises here. We're working hard. We're working our tails off. And listen, I respect that. Now, the average dock worker is making 81 grand a year. There are folks who are making over $200,000 a year. So it appears they're doing all right. But here would be my message to the dock workers as we get it going on a Friday morning and they get back to work and, you know, they're getting back into the saddle, so to speak. When you think about the upcoming election, please ask yourself why your dollar doesn't go as far. Please just just ask, because I we know that unions, by the way, union members at least, are trending away from the Democratic Party. They were always diehard Democrats, most union workers and union members, and they have trended away from the party in large part just because they don't identify with what the modern day Democratic Party has become. But for those who are still kind of loyal to the blue, so to speak, and I don't mean the royals when I say loyal to the blue. I mean, loyal to the blue political party. Ask yourself why you're sitting there right now saying I can't get by. Ask yourself why you find yourself in a situation where you've got to figure out, man, these grocery bills are getting awfully expensive. What do I do to get ahead? Well, yes, striking is one way to go about it. But once again, why is that dollar not going as far? And you are seeing Kamala Harris continue to hemorrhage union workers and union voters. Her lead with union workers is down to about 9% based on some recent polling. And when you compare that to where Joe Biden was just four years ago, Biden had like a 20-point lead with union workers in the 2020 election. The polling suggests Kamala Harris's lead with union workers is down to single digits. So there is an awakening happening. That's a great thing. But at the same time, there's a lot more work to do, I believe, to get some people to see the light on how exactly we got here. And now there's been another union that has decided it is not going to do what it did in 2020. We'll tell you who that was and what that means as we kick it off on a Friday morning, 913-408-7957. Pete Mundo on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM. So the longshoremen are back to work today. This after the ILA, International Longshoremen's Association, decided to resume working immediately. They had been on strike since Tuesday at midnight. They decided, you know what, we'll get back to work. So if you were concerned and if you are hoarding toilet paper and paper towels thinking these guys were going to strike for a long time, well, you got a lot of toilet paper, I guess, lying around the house. I don't know what to tell you. But you'll be okay, I guess, till the new year. So I never thought it was going to last that long because politically speaking, I didn't believe that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris could allow it to last that long. Now, they didn't really do anything to get this thing to end. What happened is that the companies on the other side of the table decided to improve their offer a little bit. And then, of course, that got everybody back to work as of today. So it was a three day strike. Not a lot came of it, thank goodness. There still could be some backups and maybe some of the basic deliveries, 
But all in all, this will not be noticed by the average American citizen. As they get back to work, they continue their negotiations through January 15th. And, of course, that gives them time or another, what, three months to get a new contract, John. Now, don't say that because now you've just blown the whole media cover with it. When will the effect hit the metro area? Yeah, I know. You're you know? right. I shouldn't have done that. You popped the bubble there, didn't Yeah, you? that's going to be one of the investigative reporter working okay, for okay, you. Okay, everybody else listening, shh, shh, shh yeah. be quiet. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my right. gosh. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure some local cornball is trying to take that angle now for his latest news story. Could but, be 90 days, Pete. Yep, count them down. Um, this is also some bad news, though, on the union front. We were just talking about how the average union worker is fleeing the Democratic Party, which will have implications on the 2020 election. Well, yesterday, the International Association of Firefighters announced that it would not be making an endorsement in this election. They represent more than 300,000 career firefighters and emergency responders. They were the first to endorse Joe Biden's 2020 White House bid, and they have a long history of backing Democratic presidential candidates. The IAFF's decision to not endorse a candidate in the 2024 race comes two weeks after the Teamsters Union, which is also long backed Democrats, said they're not making an endorsement because, well, their internal polling showed Donald Trump up about 20 percent with members of the Teamsters Union. So now you've got the IAFF following up with the Teamsters saying, we're not going to endorse. And these have long been Democratic stalwart operations, these major nationwide unions. And now they're saying no. Now, I don't know if we have Kansas Cityans who are members of the IAFF. I don't know how it works when it comes to what firefighter Units are members, what aren't, who is, who isn't, I don't know. But what you're continuing to see here is a shift in the blue-collar worker, right? The blue-collar worker that has long been the backbone of the Democratic Party. The -the run-of-the-mill guy or gal, maybe not with the college degree, but busts their butt every day, uses their hands for a living, helps people. They have long been backers of the Democratic Party. And the Republican Party was kind of more of the, you know, country club Republican who was going to get up on a Saturday morning, go play some golf, had some money, wanted to keep his or her taxes low and maybe a little more traditional in nature. That is all changing. Kate was driving through northern Leewood the other day and she comes home and she says to me, I cannot believe how many Kamala signs are out and about. She goes, I just couldn't believe it. Kamala Harris, Tim Wall signs up and down 75th Street in Leewood. And I'm thinking to myself, well, we talked about it. I said, it's not a surprise anymore. The parties are shifting. Things are changing. You are seeing far more middle class, working class voters come into the Republican Party tent. And you are seeing those who haven't really been impacted by inflation in large part. They don't care about the price of eggs, right? They don't. It's not their thing. They're in a place where they hate Donald Trump. They can't stand him. And Kamala's policies or Joe Biden's policies, they know deep down have not been good, especially economically. But they can afford them. And from a virtue signaling perspective, they can't fathom the idea of a rube like Donald Trump being back in the White House. Meanwhile, the rest of us can't afford to be liberal. Well, yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) that's exactly right. Exactly right. Can't afford to virtue signal around announcing our allegiance to Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. That's really what it comes down to. But it's amazing because I'm watching my New York Mets last night, and you've seen this commercial if you've watched any sports Over the last couple of weeks. And I couldn't find the ad on YouTube. I wanted to play it for you, but I couldn't find it. That's always interesting. I've had that same experience. Yeah, and I couldn't find it on social media. It's where it's an ad for Kamala Harris, and it's this guy named Buddy. And Buddy's a, you know, middle-class guy. And he's like, Kamala's going to lower my prices and lower my taxes and raise taxes on the rich who aren't paying their fair share. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, 
that approach worked during the Obama years. It worked a generation ago for the Democratic Party. I don't see how that approach works today. When the person in charge, the one who has been the vice president for the last three years, was the tie-breaking votes on a bill that helped increase inflation, Inflation Reduction Act, who was second in command to Joe Biden, who has said Bidenomics is working, is now going to get the working class voter to show up and believe that she's the one who can fix the economy and get prices under control. I don't know who's going to buy that. But they're going back to that well. And if there's ever a time it's not going to work, it's now. It's this moment in American history where people are going to say, I'm not buying that anymore. Literally and figuratively, I'm not buying it. I'm not voting for it. I can see right through it. We'll know more, of course, come November 6th, the day after the election. But you have prime examples of it right here in Kansas City, where you go to certain parts of town and you know what you're going to see. It's like when I was in Brookside a couple of weeks ago for the wiffle ball tournament. was driving through and I couldn't believe the signage saying, Harris Walls, we won't go back. And I'm like, back to what? Reasonable prices? World peace? What do we not want to go back to exactly? I mean, fine, orange man bad. I get it. You don't like the guy. But outside of that, what are you not wanting to go back to if you take Donald Trump the man out of it? Please tell me what you're not wanting to go back to. But, of course, that question, in large part, cannot be answered. 913-408-7957. It's a a Friday morning here on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM. This on the text line. Pete, uh, Kansas City Fire Department, KCK, pretty much every Metro Fire Department is associated with the IAFF the firefighters union that just snubbed Kamala Harris after endorsing Biden four years ago. I wonder if any of our IAFF members would care to call in right now. Or text in if you want to remain anonymous. How surprised are you by this? What is the conversation happening amongst IAFF members on this front? 913-408-7957. Pete Mundo on a Friday morning on KCMO Talk Radio. We've got some new insight into the VP debate strategy that just took place. We'll get to that and more on KCMO. When you think you're getting the fastball, they throw you the curveball and you swing and miss right over the top of it. Good morning, 635. Happy Friday. I'm not just using that baseball reference because the Royals are getting set for the Yankees tomorrow. My Mets got a huge win last night in Milwaukee to advance to the NLDS. But I'm using this baseball reference because, well, that's what J.D. Vance did to Tim Walls on Tuesday night. And Axios did a very good job covering this. The approach from J.D. Vance totally threw Tim Walls off his game. J.D. Vance showed up on that debate stage, and they thought they were going to be MAGA-breathing crazies. And instead, what you got was a very folksy J.D. Vance. Was an, ah, Tim. Tim, I really do feel bad for you, Tim. Ah, Tim, you know, that's not a bad point there, Tim. And Tim Walls, you could see it with his deer-in-the-headlights look, looked over at J.D. Vance and was like, who the hell is this guy? He did not know what was coming. And Axios covered this in a piece they dropped last night saying, J.D. Vance went into the VP debate with a plan to surprise Tim Walls by being shockingly dot, 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 super duper nice. Why it matters, writes Axios, it worked. The result was a refreshingly substantive, even cheery debate, a flashback to a less polarized America and a preview of what's possible. If the nation's current rage subsides, but it was a premeditated political maneuver to rattle walls. Walls was girded for war against Vance, who has spent the past 10 weeks defending past controversial remarks. Instead, Vance greeted walls with a big smile. The two shook hands warmly right off the bat. It set a very different tone than the icy encounter between the top of the ticket nominees. 
A close J.D. Vance advisor told Axios, quote, we figured it would throw him off. Democrats and much of the media bought their own false caricature of J.D., that he was just some heartless fire breather. The Vance advisor added, quote, we had an intentional strategy of not being overly adversarial and aggressive and jumping down Walls' throat on every little thing. And that's exactly why J.D. Vance won that debate on Tuesday night. And, you know, I've heard some of my colleagues talk about this. I heard Ben Shapiro the day after saying that he wished there were moments that J.D. Vance jumped down Tim Walls' throat and pointed out the radical nature of Tim Walls' beliefs and his time as governor and his running mate, Kamala Harris. And I said to you on Wednesday, I said, no, that was perfect. Because VP debates aren't actually about the issues. No one actually cares about vice presidents 99% of the time. They don't. It's not, those debates have nothing to do with policy. Those debates are all about how they make you feel. And for J.D. Vance, who was this caricature of himself, courtesy of the media, he was the guy who mocked childless cat ladies. He was the guy who talked about eating the pets in Springfield, Ohio. J.D. Vance showed up on that stage in front of 40 million Americans and was overly normal. Was normal to the point where it probably made a lot of people who thought J.D. Vance was something else who bought the media caricature of J.D. Vance, it probably made them wonder why the heck they've been trusting the people who have been telling them that for the better part of 10 weeks. At least I would if I had any common sense. And that's why the strategy was brilliant. It didn't need to be about being a mini Donald Trump. That doesn't help the ticket at all. What J.D. Vance did brilliantly is soften the edges of the ticket. And do it with a twinkle in his eye. And do it in a way where he almost, at times, felt sorry for Tim Walls. Like when he said this. Tim, I think you got a tough job here. Because you've got to play whack-a-mole. You've got to pretend that Donald Trump didn't deliver rising take-home pay, which of course he did. You've got to pretend that Donald Trump didn't deliver lower inflation, which of course he did. And then you've simultaneously got to defend Kamala Harris's atrocious economic record, which has made gas, groceries, and housing unaffordable for American citizens. I was raised by a woman who would sometimes go into medical debt so that she could put food on the table in our household. I know what it's like to not be able to afford the things that you need to afford. We can do so much better. To all of you watching, we can get back to an America that's affordable again. We just got to get back to Kamala common sense economic principles. I hope we have a conversation on health care then. So that was J.D. Vance being like, you know, Tim, I really feel bad for you. I feel bad that you've got to play this game of whack-a-mole. I have sympathy for you, Tim Walls. And it was a brilliant approach. Now, Axios asked whether Walls was surprised, and one of his aides told them, quote, we expected more MAGA mode, given what Vance has been saying repeatedly on the stump. So to use a chief's analogy or a football analogy in general, the defense showed up thinking Mahomes was going to sling it all around the field. And instead, what did they do? They used Pacheco if he's healthy, Carson Steele, end arounds with Xavier Worthy. That's what they did instead. They did the opposite. The Trump campaign with J.D. Vance did the opposite of what the defense was expecting. They thought they were going to get fire-breathing MAGA man. And instead, they got a guy who got up there and said, you know, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Donald Trump's my running mate. Here are my ideas. And I feel bad for the guy I'm running against because he's got an impossible job. And that's why J.D. Vance had such an effective night. And that's also why you had the media melting down, or at least some media, melting down the way it did like Nicole Wallace on MSNBC. It's the audacity. I, 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 I agree with you that we're in year nine. And no one knows how to cover the audacity. Mm -hmm. The audacity is it is it someone should have said stop it. Stop. Stop. (laughs) Are you effing kidding me? And they should have they should have dropped that F bomb. Right. I mean, they should have just we this is the debate. This may be the only chance people have to see the difference. That's what's got him so ticked off. That J.D. ran circles around them. He didn't give them the caricature of who they thought he was and who they thought he was going to be. 
And as one J.D. Vance advisor told Axios as well, J.D.'s focus on bipartisanship was intentional because we all knew it was a side of J.D. the media has largely ignored. And that is true, by the way. J.D. does have more, since he's more of a populist than he is anything else, he does have more in common with like a Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren than you might think. Now, I personally don't care for that. As a guy who wants to see less government and is a small C conservative, like I'm not a fan of some of these Elizabeth Warren, J.D. Vance, populist, the big guys are bad mentality. I get it. I understand it. I think there's a sliver of what they're saying that is accurate. But I also believe it's tied to more big government, which I'm just inherently not a fan of. It's why I was skeptical of the pick. But here's the thing. Trump's first term in office was much more of a small C conservative in his approach and his policies than the populist bombastic approach that we've gotten on the campaign trail over the last 10 years. So I'm not as worried about it. But it is true that J.D. Vance on a bipartisan basis does have a lot in common with certain people on the left. And that's been ignored by the media because, once again, they have to turn him into this fire-breathing MAGA man. They have no choice who doesn't like single women who have cats. That's all they've turned him into because that's what they need to win. They need to double down on that base to win. But the problem for them is that's not the guy who showed up. The question is, do the childless cat ladies like Taylor Swift care? Did they watch and did they notice? 913-408-7957. As we roll through the uh, 6 o'clock hour, happy Friday morning on KCMO Talk Radio 95.7 FM. I have a question for you when we get to the 7 o'clock hour about whether or not you'd vote for a new Royal Stadium now that they are in the postseason. Plus, Kevin Keatsman is one hour away on 95.7 FM KCMO. Here is my question for you on a Friday morning as we get set for the Royals taking on the Yankees tomorrow. They're in the playoffs. They're, of course, uh, getting set for hopefully a nice little playoff run here. Game one tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow night, depending how you want to look at it, about 530 Central Time. And then they'll play game two on Monday, which will be about 45 minutes before the Chiefs host the Saints here at Arrowhead Stadium. So, And it's not going to be at the K. It's going to be in New York. But still, you're going to have these games going on at the same time. So with that being the case, here's my question for you as we sit here all these months later on a Friday morning. Many of you would call this show and say, I'm not voting for a new stadium because this team stinks. This team's been bad for a decade. And until they start playing some winning baseball, I'm not paying any of my money for the Royals to get a new stadium. Having this team in the ALDS, is that enough where if there was a vote next spring to continue a sales tax in Jackson County, let's say, you would say, you know what, I'm in. I'm on board with that. 913-408-7957. Because we know there was a portion of the fan base and the voting base who said, John, I'm not Mm -hmm. doing it because the team stinks. And that is a a traditional reason offered in many markets for a reason for teams, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so sometimes those that would use that excuse might tend to now move the goalposts and say... Well, it's just one year here. I don't know about <laughs> next year now. Yeah. You know, some of these guys are free agents. Well, you're right. And that's why some I'm the asking the question. may move a little. Exactly. I, I think it's fair to admit that and say, you know, I'm going to move my goalposts. Just admit you're moving them. Yeah, sure. I don't mind sure. you moving them. Yeah. Right? If you say, hey, I want to see a... a fair view. I, absolutely. I want to see a five-year run of extended quality baseball. I don't need the playoffs every year, but I need something more than just one good year. So you tell me, I mean, if you are someone who is a voter and you're also somebody who's been on the no side of helping fund this new stadium, does this change your opinion at all? The text line is the same number as well, 913-408-7957, because I want to hear from you right now. My thing was always, if you vote no, vote no because you don't like the plan. 
Vote no because you don't like the location. Vote no because you inherently disagree with the idea of the public funding a ballpark. But I always felt that the, well, you know, I just am voting no because the team stinks. Well, eventually the team's going to be good again. Now, you don't know if it's five years, 10 years, or 30 years, and we know how bad it was from 85 to 2014 around this town. But to me, it was always more about whether or not it made sense for the taxpayer, whether or not the location was a good one, what it meant for the neighborhood. All those things mattered significantly more than whether or not the team was good. Because you knew the team would draw when it's good, no matter where it is. Right? The K is going to be rocking for Game 3 next Wednesday night. I've already looked at the ticket prices. I mean, they are astronomical. The prices for the K next week are more expensive than they are for Yankee Stadium this weekend. Just to show you. What? Yes. On the secondary wow. market. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it right here, John. The tickets to get into Yankee Stadium. So you're better off flying to Yankee Stadium trying to get into a game. <laughs> Um, right, you're going to spend that money, what the heck? Why not, Take right? Take in Broadway play while you're there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, when you look at the schedule, when you look at the schedule here, um, tickets right now for Saturday's game in New York are as low as $140 for a ticket. This is according to Vivid Seats. Then game two on Monday, you can get in for 81 bucks. Game three on Wednesday, back here at uh, the K. The lowest ticket is $183, and that's before the fees. Game four, if it happens, tickets as low as $129. So the cheapest game to get into is game two Monday night at Yankee Stadium. How about that? That tells you how crazy this town is right now about this team and watching winning baseball for the first time in a decade. But does it change your opinion on the vote? On the text line, Pete, the stadium vote went down by double digits. A winning team won't change the vote for the small number of voters who care about the team not stinking. I'm not saying it's changing the vote. I agree. Yeah, that's a fair point. That is a great text. I'm not suggesting it's changing the vote. I'm just Mm -hmm. asking you whether or not if that was one of your reasons, you cared enough to now change your vote based on the fact that the team is winning. Because I know, and you all, we all know, That John Sherman is probably saying to himself in part, I've got to capitalize on this playoff run for my new stadium, wherever that might be. This certainly doesn't hurt his case. No, no. Helps him a lot. Right. And to the texter's point, right, we did highlight that there were people who didn't want it in crossroads. There are people who think we can save the K. Mm -hmm. There are people who don't want any tax dollars for sports teams, a whole Yes. Variety. We hit maybe what at least five different reasons to vote no. Yes, they so were compiled yeah. to defeat the the move. Yeah, yeah. by twenty points. Mm-hmm. So you're right. There were so many reasons where people had to vote no. It's sure. not like there was one reason. It wasn't just the crossroads. It wasn't just the taxes. It wasn't just the team stinks. But there were mm-hmm. the group of people who said the team's no good. I'm not voting for it. Yeah, and to that point, then I don't, even if a bunch everybody who said the team stinks. Switches to uh, I'm in now still maybe doesn't pass. Right? I agree. It yeah. doesn't pass. I don't think so. It's not enough. And the problem now, the best thing the Royals could do today, or at least sometime during this run, is have a concrete plan on where the heck they want to go and why. If the Royals are going to now wait till January or next year to be like, yeah, by the way, we still want that ballpark and we think it should go here. Man, they are missing the moment. The time to do it is this month. And I don't know if they're dragging their feet. I don't know what options they're looking at right now. Everybody I talk to on this has been fairly tight-lipped on the whole deal. And I don't know if that's on purpose or if that's because they actually don't have any real updates. But if they don't capitalize on this thing real soon, memories are not that long anymore. It's what have you done for me lately, like now, like yesterday. You get to January, and people are going to be forgetting about this. I mean, unless you're talking about a World Series run, people are going to be forgetting about this real fast, John. It's an October surprise is what we need. Yes, give me a local October surprise. to your point, everybody gets together, even if starting from Halloween all the way up through Christmas and the New Year, you're together with family and friends, it would be a topic of conversation. Oh, yeah. It would be hot right now.
If you hit it in the next couple of weeks, no matter what happens, whether your playoff run is done with the Yankees, still, it's going to be an incredible season based on where this team was last year. No matter what, you've got to look at the moment now and say, okay, by the way, at least give the people an update. At least try to get some enthusiasm. Roll out three finalists, right? Give yourself three locations that you're looking at. If you really want to make the stadium thing work, if you're John Sherman, you have got to have some update for the folks, and you've got to have it this month. If not, you have completely missed the boat and missed the opportunity to take advantage of this moment. 913-408-7957. Kevin Keatsman is going to join me at uh, 735 in 20 minutes to get you set for the series starting in New York this weekend. 913-408-7957. It's the 7 o'clock hour on a busy and fun Friday morning. Is it a blue Friday? Is it a red Friday? What are we calling this, by the way? <laughs> I put on a blue and red USA shirt just to cover all my bases, by the way. So I got it all yeah, covered. I guess I am, too, accidentally, but I got blue and red. Yes. And, uh, by the way, Mark is out. Garner is in, doing a great job. Mark is being a degenerate in Las Vegas this weekend. So hopefully he comes back in one piece. His flight lands Sunday night at 1150. So I have no confidence Mark is going to show up in one piece on Monday morning. So, Garner, just be prepared for another day in case we need you. All right? He's giving me a good old big thumbs up. Pete Mundo on KCMO.